Hello, everyone, and welcome to Enterprise Privacy Product Management. I'm Karthik Rahman, a senior product manager at Adobe, focused on building privacy products and services. I had been at Adobe nearly 10 years and was the lead product manager behind Adobe Experience Cloud Business Unit's GDPR product offering. As most people know, the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, became effective in 2018. I went to work one day in 2017, and my manager at the time said to me, how would you feel about dropping everything you're working on and jumping on the GDPR project? Well, I want to share some of the lessons I learned from that journey and other sins for similar product managers who may go through a similar kind of assignment. Please note that the views and opinions I express here are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of my employer. Privacy regulations are sweeping the world. Consumer expectations regarding their privacy is rising, and brands have to contend with requirements from both regulators and consumers. Now, GDPR and e-privacy have been around for a couple of years now in Europe. The California Consumer Privacy Act, another privacy regulation for California, has been effective since January 1st of 2020. And the Brazilian privacy regulation, LGPD, was effective as of August 26th, 2020. Also, we know that HIPAA, a healthcare related regulation, requires readiness in a number of different security and privacy product areas. Whether you're a B2B or a B2C product manager, chances are that given this framework of regulations popping up all over the world, that you have to think about how privacy and these regulations impacts your product and how you will respond to it. So this talk is gonna be effective or helpful for many such product managers. So what's this talk about? Why this talk and who is it for? A privacy framework is a product or service that lets your company handle privacy data processing requests at the scale of nearly all of your company's products. So let's say that you work for a company called Acme and Acme has 10 different products. The idea of a privacy framework is that there'd be a single framework to handle GDPR processing requests for access, deletion, or opt out for all of those 10 products of your employer. Companies care about this because building frameworks is efficient, right? If you build a bunch of frameworks for every single regulation that comes around, that's not very efficient. But if you can build a single one that nails it for not only the current regulation, but all the others that are coming down the pike soon, that's a lot better investment of company resources and time. Another reason this space matters is that there's a ton of demand for experts, including product managers, who have operated in the regulatory and privacy space and would do good work for companies. So this talk is geared towards product managers who are building frameworks. And it's also for product managers who are interested in learning a few new general product management techniques, uh, specifically one around cultural transformation. So this talk isn't just about privacy by design, right? How to build privacy features into non-privacy products and services, right? It's about how to build company-wide privacy, security, compliance, or other types of frameworks. So as I was saying before, you, the listener, could be a product manager responsible for building such a privacy framework across your company to respond to GDPR or CCPA. Or just as well, you could be a product manager who's uh, building privacy, security, compliance, or another kind of framework spanning all of your company's products and services. However, if you are a product manager who doesn't work in privacy, security, or compliance, but you have an innovation that you wish to spread across your organization, then this talk is also for you. The talk is structured according to the journey a product manager may take while building an enterprise privacy framework. What world do you find yourself in in the beginning of this journey as you develop requirements? What's the experience in the middle while you're building product? What does the release look like and what do you expect next? We're going to examine situations, stories, and lessons learned for every step of the journey building enterprise privacy frameworks. Okay, so you've got the job. Congratulations. Now requirements are coming in from every direction, starting with privacy legal. So where do you begin? You should start with the basics. Do you know your customers and their problems? For example, in the lingo of GDPR, if you're solving for GDPR requirements, uh, there are the roles of the data controller, 
the company, their entity that's processing data, the data processor, and the data subject. Do you know what role your organization plays? Right? Are you the data controller or the data processor? If you're the data processor, do you know how your customers, the data controllers, interact with their data subjects? For B2B businesses very often, your customers will have multiple stakeholders working on privacy. Very commonly, this is a mixture of IT, privacy, and marketing teams. As a product manager, have you interviewed all those different stakeholders at your customers, each with its own interests? Do you know who holds the power? How do they influence each other? Who the decision makers are to drive change? And how do you know that the solutions you propose are going to solve for interests, align interests across all the groups you're trying to engage? Based on what you've learned about the businesses and customer personas, how would your product solve the privacy concerns that all those stakeholders have regarding your product? Can you paint the compelling vision for them and start to validate your product hypotheses with them? So you start by talking to privacy legal and you start by talking to customers. And now it's time to turn legal requirements and jargon, customer interviews into product requirements. So you wanna turn a bunch of moving targets into a target that's stable enough that you can take aim at, write it down create decks, create mockups, evangelize those artifacts with product teams you're trying to influence and coordinate work across. It's okay for these artifacts to be imperfect or incorrect. What's more important is to be clear and precise in the definition of the what you're trying to build. Iterate with these artifacts and requirements by testing them with customers and with privacy legal. Over time, your large requirement, which spans the entire business, should stabilize. And what that frees you up to do is focus on smaller pieces, sub requirements. So you shift into requirements for smaller products or services, and you have the ability to delegate those smaller requirements to product owners over those products or services and have them reference the central document that you've created or the artifacts that you've created. Now, as you work across various product teams, you may soon run into disparate data models, diverging development philosophies, code bases that are siloed and workflows that were never meant to work with each other. You need first principles to build something simple that you can grow into something more complex over time. And you'll need to collaborate with architects to develop these, right? But don't get too much into the how. See if you can get one primary architecture owner assigned. You'll find that in building enterprise privacy frameworks, enterprise-wide frameworks, driving architecture requirements is almost as important as driving product requirements themselves. Now, two commonly used privacy principles could be what I'm gonna share. Um, and for example, if you have a requirement to delete data, the first thing is to find it. So the, the principle there would be follow the data. If data originated from a consumer, can you follow it to determine all the different places where it ends up. Those are all the different places the data would have to be deleted from if you're processing a GDPR deletion request or a CCPA deletion request. The next principle is garbage in, garbage out. This is kind of out of computer science 101, but just like in a search engine, you're building a system to find consumer data in your data warehouses, right? And your search engine is only as good as the input you supply to it. So What's the type of consumer identity you're supplying to it in order to find the right data? Product managers realize play a very important role in translating privacy requirements into engineering rules. And it's critical to continually collaborate with engineering and legal during this process. Now designing your framework for scale and to scale is essential. So think about your enterprise's long-term privacy needs for each product or service that you launch. You're serving one regulation today, but you know that multiple regulations are coming down the pike and you'll need to support them in the same fashion. So in somewhat contrary fashion to the uh, Peter Thiel piece of advice of don't go uh, going from zero to one, as a PM building frameworks, you wanna go zero to one the first time, but then go from N to N plus one, uh, you know, sitting on top of the initial framework that you've created. Regulations are here to stay, and more of them are becoming effective the world over with time. So as you think about long-term needs, look for efficiencies. Take the side of the customer. So for example, if you know that your company has 10 products, all of which must be ready for, say, GDPR or CCPA, take the side of the customer and say, you know what, 
consolidating work will mean that the customer uses a single entry point for sending GDPR requests or a single entry point for CCPA deletions. And their user experience will be the same or consistent regardless of which of the 10 products of your companies they're provisioned with. There may be an exception here. For example, if one of your company's products out of the 10 is going to be decommissioned soon, it may be okay for the customer to interact with that product directly, but use your judgment in cases like that. Experienced product managers know this. For any product to be successful, you need an executive sponsor. But executive sponsor seeds the project. They build visibility at the executive level so that the project stays top of mind for all other executives your sponsor meets. The sponsor would lobby for resources from across the organization, help resolve blockers, and liaise with customer executives in case of high profile customers. And in addition, liaise with these customer executives in case of product escalations. At this stage, your product requirements are stable, the project has been commissioned, and engineering is executing. So what are some of the challenges you might face in the following phase of the project while you're executing, and how might you solve them? One challenge you will face many a time is that you're up against a deadline that will not move. For example, GDPR was going to become effective in May of 2018, no matter what. But you start to realize, despite the deadline that won't move, you start to get your project off course. So what do you do with teams and executives whose direction isn't completely aligned with your project's direction? I offer that you should start by aligning on purpose with your stakeholders. Is there a company value or set of values that may resonate with privacy, compliance, or ethics as you build these frameworks? How about integrity, ethics, or putting the con consumer first? There's usually a deadline and getting off schedule could be catastrophic. And one of the tools you'll need to employ in this space is urgency. So I'm flashing here three example phrases you could use to drive urgency with stakeholders in your organization. Your mileage may vary based on your personal style and your corporate culture. Another challenge you might face is building a product that customers will actually use, right? The fact that you're rushing to meet a regulatory deadline, but end up building a product that is unusable will leave your customers and your executives fuming. In the beginning, you're swamped with legal requirements, but you actually realize that many customers are moving much more slowly than you are in interpreting the same regulations for themselves and getting to a point of uh, contention that I know what I want from you, the product manager for this business. So in a situation like that, validate your requirements, go to your customer, take your design to the customer. Here's a picture of me presenting my product designs to customers in Munich in a product roadshow. Paint the vision for your product, share the current state of requirements, interview customers to learn how to refine your requirements further. Now you may definitely run into situations where your release timelines don't line up with your customer's release timelines. So in other words, your customer wants the product in their hands yesterday and you simply can't achieve that for them. Instead of clashing with your customer, try to take their side. It's possible you could recruit their energy or anxiety into an alpha or beta participation and feedback. If your customer wants access to your product in advance, maybe you can negotiate their inclusion in an alpha program so they understand that for participation, they'll get a bicycle from you instead of a car and that you're looking for their feedback to design the right car and deliver that right car to them so that they can actually use it. The next challenge is an interdependence, a constant one, on privacy legal. Now, as you know, you start with interpreting regulations and you turn those regulations and interpretations into a set of product requirements, working hand in hand with privacy legal. Indeed, they are your best friends through a journey like this. But building on that, in the space of privacy frameworks, nearly every other sub requirement will require input from privacy legal or require approval from them. So solid relationships with friends and legal can help you move product development and release more quickly. I also want to offer that you could turn this kind of dependence or interdependence into an opportunity. And that opportunity is to leverage that relationship with privacy legal to help your fellow product managers 
who don't work as closely with Privacy Legal. So serve as an ambassador for product into Privacy Legal. Bring product design concerns or requirements gaps from fellow product managers to Privacy Legal. Now, as you become known as a facilitator of product work, as a broker of that important relationship, you win points with both sides, both the business and Privacy Legal. The next challenge is a proactive one. Are you taking enough product risk? We just referenced a minute ago, product managers work with Privacy Legal, but usually they're part of the business, not part of the legal team. Part of what product managers are paid to do is take on the right amount of product risk in what you design and build. Experienced product managers know that perfect designs may cost too much and take too long to build. There's a real cost and a timeline sacrifice in over-engineering products. It's no use building a perfect product if you've built it past the regulatory deadline and released it past the regulatory deadline. Also, good product managers know that they are trading off speed and quality with the risk of imperfect design. The next challenge is to keep up momentum while you're executing, sorting through unexpected turns, new requirements, obstacles, or keeping multiple executing teams aligned is crucial. Now, this isn't a summary of PM hustle techniques by any stretch of the imagination, but here are two techniques that have worked for me. Your mileage may vary depending on your personal style and the way your organization's culture is set up. But I've tried to set up an agenda for every meeting and set clear next steps and owners. In addition, I've tried to follow up on unanswered emails every two days, and both of these techniques have helped me and my projects keep momentum up. You're going to discover several challenges as you do this work. Espousing an entrepreneurial mindset is crucial. You discover that you're working in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment, and every complex project, despite of its stakes, will have setbacks. Take a step back when that happens. Take on the optimist mantra. It's a setback, but a temporary one. This is loosely from Martin Seligman's book, Learned Optimism. Beyond that, as you run into technical challenges or conflicts, stay focused on shared purpose and values. For example, you could state to your internal stakeholders, you know, we're working together to help our common customers meet obligations to regulators and serve their consumers. If you're building an innovation with limited resources, what is your learning objective? Are you staying continually curious about your customer? And then last but not least, write. As I mentioned, you're operating in an ambiguous and complex environment. Uh, noting down your observations day over day can lead to valuable insights over time. And as the product matures, your notes, whatever shape or form they're in, can see the product collateral that you can hand off to product marketers. So write to make sense and rationalize the day-to-day -day hustle. Okay, so you've got an executive sponsor, but what you're finding is that that's not enough to drive product work across your company, across different silos. You've got a limited pool of resources and you need input and engagement from various teams in order to deliver your product in the right time. But you're getting ignored by several teams, executives, individual stakeholders. Now the nature of a framework is that it touches the entire company. And for something that touches the entire company, you'll need to transform the culture of your organization in order to get traction and get results because the strict pool of resources at your disposal isn't going to cut it. So what you realize in that moment is that you are actually leading a cultural transformation. This is where I'll reference leadership thinker Simon Sinek and his 10 minute video on the law of diffusion of innovation. Now you're welcome to check out that talk, but let's apply it quickly to building privacy frameworks. All populations fit across normal distributions. For privacy, there are those who care a lot about privacy on the one hand, and on the other end of the distribution, there are those who couldn't be bothered. The first 2.5%, they wanna be part of privacy no matter what, they are your champions. The next 12.5%, the folks who sacrifice time and energy to test out your product and collaborate with you early, they are your early adopters. The question is, how do you influence the next 68%? That is to say the majority. They're not anti-privacy, they're just cynical and practical. They're asking, you know, is the business headed in this direction of adopting this framework or privacy or security more broadly? 
I have other pressing things to deliver on this quarter, and frankly, this is in the way. The advice here is, the counsel here is that don't focus on anyone beyond the first 15% of your organization. That is the champions and the early adopters, right? Uh, as you focus on the early adopters, you'll find that change diffuses through the organization. In my own example, my team and I created a group for motivated and interested folks to join. These folks would meet like once a week and they take product directions from this core group and go and diffuse it within their own products. And what they bring back in exchange is edge cases and best practices back to the central group. Soon, executives and other influential stakeholders across the company had heard about this group and they had no choice but to join in because their own people were asking to be a part of it. So you're building a grassroots movement. Congratulations. You're executing on your project and you're actually getting close to launching your framework. Now what? It's very often that you're going to encounter conflicts between two or three or whatever different groups. And these may betray long held misgivings across these different organizations. So what's the right attitude in a situation like this? I want to offer that perhaps the right attitude here is one of indifference, as long as there are two conditions that are held. One is, regardless of who wins this particular conflict, are you headed in the right direction of releasing this product? Further, are you headed in the direction of releasing this product within the specified time? The path through a complex system, such as building a privacy framework, doesn't matter as long as you're continually optimizing to reach the end state within the desired time. You've launched your product and now it's time to say thank you. And it turns out there's an art to it. it this comes from Scott Belsky, Adobe's chief product officer in his book, The Messy Middle. Belsky says that in a time like this, when you're close to launching a product, it's essential to recognize those individuals who stuck their neck out for the cause when rewards were unclear and the risks were high. Empower your champions and early adopters so that you have their influence available for the next wave of work. So you've delivered your product, now what? If you're lucky, you'll get recognition and more resources. You should recognize for a sober second that in the long run, all resource allocation is variable. However, if you're unlucky, paradoxically, the reward for success may be that you have fewer resources available for the next lap. This is one reason why building a framework in this space is crucial, is that in a self-serving way, whether you have more or less resources, You've done the work, you've laid the foundations in order to adopt the next regulation or build the next product using that foundation of the framework. Now, product managers know that the job isn't over with the product launch. Through conception, building, execution, testing, and release, you are capturing technical debt in the product. Because in, especially in a space like this, you know that this technical debt, if unaddressed, could be a source of customer escalations and it could trigger the next product crisis but no one is better suited than you to tackle the next crisis. So you may actually need to run another lap with your same product. Uh, the good news is that you have some tools at your disposal that you know you ha they have worked for you. For example, you know how to build crisis to get past those initial obstacles. So let's say you've launched your product successfully and you've gone through escalations. How do you self-evaluate? How do you evaluate your performance as a product manager if your goal is to build enterprise privacy frameworks? I wanna offer that if you were to adopt the next regulation, how much more quickly and efficiently can you get your business to adopt it? That is to say, can you actually go N to N plus one instead of going back to scratch and building a new framework or a new product to go from zero to one again? A more advanced concept is one of Considering, have you been able to reframe the internal dialogue away from risk reduction into one of adding value to customers? Have you improved how your organization thinks about and manages risk? Thought leaders in this space, product managers who are ahead of the game may encourage their business to think about privacy as a differentiator or think about technology ethics and how that bears on privacy. Where are the product leaders in this domain headed? And can you point your business leaders into that vision? We're actually at the end here, so let's summarize. Privacy regulations are sweeping the world. Every product manager 
is going to be touched by one of these regulations in some way, shape, or form. And your goal, if you're one of the lucky product managers assigned to work in this space, is to build a framework so that whether it's you or a different PM in the same company responding to the subsequent regulation, you're going from N to N plus one instead of from zero to one all over again. Never waste a crisis because you'll have resources at their disposal to start this project and start this work. However, you'll always have setbacks. So espouse an entrepreneurial mindset and say to yourself, it's only a temporary setback and you'll get through it. Last but not least, recognize that building privacy frameworks and other kinds of frameworks is a matter of diffusing innovation. So privacy framework building is cultural transformation. Focus on your company's champions in privacy and focus on the early adopters. And that's a crucial path to success. I wanna thank everyone for listening. My name is Karthik Raman. You can get in touch with me through the email address on your screen and also connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like. I wanna say a special thank you to my friend, Tim Masterson, who is the designer behind these slides. And here are the references I mentioned through this talk. Thanks a lot, everyone.